This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. And I'm Ariana Brocious. In the U.S., climate is a polarizing issue. Addressing the transitions we need to make requires engaging with people who see things differently. That requires looking beyond villainization, listening more, judging less. But let's face it, judging is easy and listening can be hard. And sometimes these conversations can be really uncomfortable. Still, civil conversation is so important to finding common ground. Without it, we end up in a stalemate or with one side pushing through policies that the other side tries to stop when they get into power. And all of that slows the progress toward a goal that we all share, which is keeping our planet habitable. I'm involved in this because somebody appealed to what I think we were all born with, which is an innate desire to be good stewards over this earth. In this episode, we're going to hear from two people who are not typical voices on a climate show. These two guests were recommended by a center-right think tank, Clear Path. Right, because climate can be seen as a political issue, in the U.S. especially, and it's often framed as one that the liberal or the left cares about more than the right. That's not actually true in all cases. It just depends on how we're talking about the issue. A lot of the things that we want to do are actually similar. We just maybe use different words for them. And it's really important that we have conversations with both sides of the aisle on this so that we can actually make things happen. Later in this episode, we'll try to bridge that gap with my conversation with John Curtis, representative from Utah and chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus in the House. The extremism sometimes in this conversation scares Republicans away. Right? Extremism is not good on either side. But the reality, uh, as you know, if we want to make long-lasting changes, we need to be in a bipartisan mode on this. And clearly, to the extent that we're bipartisan, we'll, we'll make quicker uh, action. To unpack what I think he's saying there, bipartisan legislative action is slower to achieve and more durable once policies in place. And that durability will lead to faster emission reductions because there's consistency over time and administration. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of evidence to show that even oil and gas companies, I mean, any kind of business industry wants predictability, right? So the more that we can come together around some of these issues and pass bipartisan policy, the better it'll be for really all players. Right. And although the Inflation Reduction Act was one party, it does seem to be pretty durable and popular on the other side, in part because there's a lot of Republican tax friendly ideas in there. I also spoke with Arjun Murthy, who is a partner at Veritin, an energy consultancy who holds board or advisory positions at ClearPath. Conoco Phillips, the large oil company developing the new Willow Project in Alaska, and the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. There's so many things we can do from a positive standpoint. I get excited about it, but then get frustrated when I see the kind of debate being either on the left, fossil fuels are evil, or on the right, solar and wind are dumb, the climate's always changing, let's do nothing. Arjun says things that will definitely challenge, even upset, our regular listeners. Yeah, it's a perspective we don't always have here on Climate One. And I'm kind of curious, Greg, what it was like just having that conversation and interviewing him. It was challenging for me. I wanted to jump in and say, but, 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 counter. And I think that kind of challenge is constructive. Honestly, how often do our listeners, even we, hear from a board member at a major oil company or a Republican member of Congress talking about energy and climate? This is really hard and really important. And yet, meanwhile, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just released a new synthesis report emphasizing that decarbonization has to speed up dramatically to keep global heating under dangerous levels. So we are in a moment of real urgency and we have to act. Right. I did ask Murti about the pace of the overall energy transition. I think we're currently on track for a, what I'm going to call a worst of all worlds where we've done nothing to bend the curve on greenhouse gas emissions. But due to what I might call a war on fossil fuel supply, we're on track to simply have high and volatile prices. And so I think in a world where we are trying to provide energy for all, available, abundant, secure, reliable, but to do so with an improving environmental footprint and a decreasing carbon intensity, I don't think we're currently on track for that. So if the IPCC report is calling for a need to accelerate the transition, so far, I think progress is lagging. And that's lagging. So some people would say that's lagging because the industry is trying to slow it down and in Washington and, and elsewhere. And you're saying that villainization of supply is the problem. That's why we're not going faster. There's so much focus on fossil fuel supply as if changing fossil fuel supply will somehow lead to a change in greenhouse gas emissions. To me, the question is demand. Why do we demand fossil fuels in the first place? It is to power economies. Uh, both at, a, at an advanced level and a basic level. 
We, the world needs energy, and it is why we use crude oil, natural gas, and coal. What the world needs is to find alternative sources of supply that compete effectively with oil, natural gas, and coal. We're making some progress, but there's still a long way to go. Where I think there's a real missed opportunity is to address the demand side of the equation. And I feel like there's, especially perhaps in the environmental community, this idea that all we need to do is stop supply and somehow magically demand will go away. And I would actually flip that on its head and say, until you attack the demand side of the equation, until you move off, for example, sport utility vehicles, until you truly address what are some low hanging efficiency gains that can happen, and until we have really an abundance of alternative forms of energy that actually compete effectively with fossil fuels, it's not going to be a question of trying to kill fossil fuels or not. And, and I, I, I would like the conversation to eventually evolve to addressing the demand side of the equation as much time as we spend on the supply side. What often happens is uh, electricity and liquid transportation fuels are conflated. And I would say that if you take of the electricity side, there has been a uh, change in supply. You know, I now have solar on my roof. A lot of people do around the country. Solar and wind have created alternative supply for electricity. And but the problem is for liquid transportation fuels, you know, petroleum's had a monopoly for a century and there, there aren't the same level of biofuels haven't really materialized the way we thought they would 10 years ago. Isn't that the supply and demand different when you're talking about electricity versus transportation fuels? Greg, this is such a great point, and thank you for raising it, because it gets to a heart of a bunch of different issues. Electricity tends to be local, both in its production and its use. And it is possible to change your electricity grid to move away from fossil fuels, if that's a goal, to other forms of energy. Now, I would say that today, solar and wind can be a portion of your electricity mix, but until we get real gains in storage or other forms of uh, ensuring it's 24-7 electricity, we're probably going to need nuclear, which is zero carbon, to be part of this mix. And that's probably a bigger conversation than we're on track to have right now. I think for the developing world, the question is, why did China add so much coal in the last 25 years as it industrialized? It was an abundant, large, inexpensive resource and it employs a lot of people and generates tax revenues and so forth. And I think when I look at the developing world, they also are gonna want 24 seven, 365. So I like solar and wind, I'm in no way here to knock it. What I would argue though, is if you're a developing country and you have really inexpensive coal, I think it's a big challenge of how are you gonna get them to do other stuff that is lower carbon, most notably solar and wind in the absence of a low cost storage solution that can compete with both the cost of coal uh, and the jobs and tax benefits of coal. I think that's challenge number one. I think for transportation fuels, this is where I would, I, I wish there was more of an appreciation that those are global markets. Whereas local uh, electricity tends to be local, oil and gas tends to be global. And one of the frustrations I have is that we often see um, attacks on, I will just say US, Canadian and European oil companies uh, when all that happens is production gets shifted to other countries in the rest of the world, I would think uh, a global approach to crude oil, natural gas, and, and that part of the equation would be a better way to go. Right. And that's very much just a global uh, commodity. And natural gas is kind of transitioning from a regional commodity to perhaps a global commodity. Oil and gas companies are raking in record profits. President Biden's 2024 budget proposes an elimination of, quote, special tax treatment for oil and gas company investments. That's probably referring to accelerated depreciation. The White House noted oil and gas companies cut their investment as a share of operating cash flows to the lowest levels in a decade while undertaking record stock buybacks that benefited executives and shareholders. What do you think of the way that oil and gas companies are deploying their capital? You know, I would push back on the narrative that I think you correctly articulated in terms of how it's projected by the Biden administration and the, to the general media. This is an industry that from 2010 to 2020 had a zero, these are U.S. companies, a 0% return on capital, really poor profitability. And why? They actually overinvested uh, as a result of the boom that happened in the 2000s. Uh, and the profits uh, from production were actually pretty poor. Uh, and it, it, you're actually one of these ironic points where the environmental and climate community would like less oil and gas investment and traditional investors say, hey, you guys wasted a bunch of money last decade. Don't waste it this time around. 2020 companies lost billions of dollars. This was our COVID year when the world economy shut down. And from that very deep trough, 
we had a pretty dramatic rebound to 2022. So it's accurate that in 2022, profits were at very high levels. But if you took even a 10-year average that included 2022, I believe the average is 25 to 3% return on capital, which is still pretty poor by any standard. So if you're a traditional investor, there's still the, the mantra, hey, companies, don't waste money. You wasted money last decade. And if I'm a traditional investor, not a climate person, a traditional investor, I am uncertain as to what the pace of oil demand growth will be. I am uncertain whether some of the policies, some of the net zero objectives, uh, some of the climate initiatives, maybe they will start to bite on demand. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But as long as I'm unsure of that, and as long as I know that you wasted money last decade, I don't want you to invest currently, or at least not for the foreseeable future. And I'd say that is the number one reason, I think, why CapEx has felt slower to respond. There's also been a need to repair or were pretty weak balance sheets uh, from last decade, too high of a debt level. So there's been some debt, debt pay down. And you're correct. Investors have said, instead of wasting your money in oil and gas like you did last decade, I'd rather see it come back to me in the form of dividends and stock buybacks. So that is accurate. The Biden administration recently approved the controversial Willow Project, which is an oil extraction project on Alaska's North Slope in the National Petroleum Reserve. As a board member of ConocoPhillips, a corporation developing Willow, I understand you can't comment directly on that project because directors are not authorized to speak for the company on that. So let me ask you this way. Oil executives, like all corporate executives, run the company to increase the stock price. You're a Wall Street analyst. You know that better than I do. And that stock price is valued on future Future revenues derived from extracting and burning oil and methane gas. The science is really clear that we can't burn the deposits already on the balance sheets of the investor and state-owned oil companies. So at what point is it irresponsible for, for companies to kind of refill that balance sheet, their reserves every year. And I've even heard this kind of indirectly from some people inside Conoco. It's like, we'd like to get off this, but their whole system is built on replenishing reserves that we know someday can't be burned. Can you correctly note that I can't speak about specific projects, be it on a company I'm involved with or for that matter, other companies. But I think it gets to the heart of the issue of where we source our global oil and supply and gas from. You know, And so even in the IEA's net zero report that lays out a scenario uh, for, for 2050 net zero, one and a half degrees, a scenario I think we're not on track to achieve, but let's just take that scenario. Even in that scenario, there is something like 30 million barrels a day of oil demand still produced. About a third, are, a third of what we have today, right? Th that is correct. Our U.S. production uh, is 12 million barrels a day of crude oil and another five or six million barrels a day of natural gas liquid. So it, I would say it's six, let's just call it 18 million barrels a day versus the 30. I believe it should be our national objective that the U.S. is the last barrel produced in the energy transition, whether that's 2050 or 2100 or some different year, the cleanest, best barrels, most secure, most reliable should come from, I'm going to say, the United States plus Canada. And when we don't produce it here, and, I, and we could talk about any project, it could be Marcellus Gas, it could be things like Keystone Excel, any of these pipelines or infrastructure projects that have faced environmental protest. My question always is, why would you rather be produced? And I apologize, I'm an American in Russia or Iran or Iraq or other countries where the environmental, the geopolitical and other measures are far, are far more lax or unfavorable to Americans. And I think this is what I feel most strongly about. Saudi Aramco has a target to grow its supply by a million barrels a day over the next five years. The United Arab Emirates is looking to grow its supply. I actually think they're gonna do it in a low carbon way. I wanna give UAE credit for having some excellent decarbonization plans. And I actually think uh, it's going to challenge our companies to match what they're doing. But countries like Russia, countries like Iran, why don't environmentalists go protest in those countries? Well, because they don't have any influence in those countries. And every country wants to be the last producer of the last barrel. And the Saudis would say they'll be the ones because their lifting costs, the cost of getting it out of the ground, are lower than everybody else. So doesn't, you know, low cost win? Low cost will absolutely win. And I think that's where... Uh, that's where whether it's a company in our country or a company in another part of the country, low cost is absolutely going to win. Now, whether some of those other countries subsidize their production or have other things, th that's probably for another podcast. What I will say, though, the other fundamental thing we started with is demand is 100 million barrels a day today. It's it's not 30. And it's it's not on track, whether I want it to be, whether you want it to be, whether scientists want it to be or not. It's not on track to go down. It may It will go down, most likely in Europe and Japan, and it's possible that in the United States, 
we may be past sort of our peak demand type environment due to population maturity and increasing efficiency, but it is absolutely going to grow. There's 3 billion people, there's 5 billion people who use a heck of a lot less energy than we do, and they're going to demand something. And it gets back to let's provide alternate forms of supply and whatever supply we have, wherever it's from, it should have zero or near zero methane. And I believe our company should be held to a scope one net zero type of standard. The exact year we can probably debate, but I have no issues with holding our companies to very strict environmental standards. And I think they themselves want to be held to those kind of standards. But let's not pretend by protesting individual projects in our country or Canada that somehow that changes the demand trajectory by a single barrel. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversation. Coming up, can focusing on consumer experience facilitate decisions that are also good for the climate? I am personally a very happy owner of an electric vehicle, and I will never or I'm very unlikely to ever drive a gasoline car again because I simply enjoy driving the electric vehicle better. And I think that's the type of positive engagement and positive consumer choices I'd like to see. That's up next. Let's get back to my conversation with energy consultant Arjun Murthy. Pressure on investor-owned oil and gas companies in the United States has risen recently because of environmental, social, and governance, or ESG, filters that are now quite popular on Wall Street. Yet Republicans in the House passed a bill that would make illegal consideration of those ESG issues. I asked Murthy his view of the bill and the campaign against ESG. Much like climate and energy, it is deeply unfortunate that somehow environmental, social, and governance, which is a pretty obscure element of Wall Street stock analysis, has somehow become part of our culture war. I mean, Greg, I, I, I cannot explain it other than everything's part of the culture war. And I will say, I will push back on both sides as I do on climate and energy policy, and I'll do so here on ESG. So I think it's unfortunate when the left, for example, uh, tries to pressure companies, we should be very concerned about increasing corporate power, and having de facto policy legislation being run through some of these ESG initiatives. So some of that I push back on. On the right, for people on the right, I'll push back and say, we've always considered these factors. Governance has always been an important issue for any stock you're covering. People have always cared about environmental issues. I used to own a, a refining company early in my career. And we wondered, hey, they're cutting costs. Are they cutting costs too much to where the refinery may not run safely? And that was something I wondered about when I was 25 years old. I didn't call it ESG at the time, but I think I will push back on both sides. Why would we want corporations to have more power by de facto implementing policies that have not been legislatively passed? And on the right side, these are normal <laughs> these are normal stock market considerations. Outlawing it is the wrong reaction to what people on the right might perceive as the excesses of the left. Well, and I will agree with you on the sort of the concern of kind of corporations as as uh, avenues for for public policy. Isn't it true that companies that have good, strong, diverse boards that consider impact on community environment aren't don't they also perform better? This is not about virtue. This is like you know, hasn't Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, and others said this is just sound business? Whenever I've evaluated a company or a management, I've wanted to see that there has been diversity of perspectives. Now, that, that doesn't mean in 100% of the cases that that is always the best performing stock. But I, you know, certainly the situations I've been involved in, I appreciate hearing perspectives from those in the environmental and climate community that is not my core group. I think having Wall Street type people can be helpful. I think having folks who have run companies are helpful. So to your point, uh, having on a board, having as part of your management team, people that can bring a range of skill sets, uh, I think is critically important. The, the one specific element of traditional diversity that I think is very important is actually gender diversity. And I don't mean to overstate it, but I, th I think there, there are differences in how genders approach things. And I, I've certainly been a big advocate of ensuring that gender diversity is well represented. Right. And that's something that hasn't been the case uh, so much in energy. And I think it, it is it is gradually changing. So if you know what kind of risk are do companies what kind of risk are companies facing by not doing something? Because we often talk about the cost Oh, that we can't change because there's a cost. But there's also the status quo has costs. We're seeing more and more billion dollar disasters, the floods and fires in the West everywhere. So how is you think about the cost of inaction? 
I'm going to frame well it from the, the cost perspective of, of looking at companies here. And I think you said it really well, which is you cannot live in the past and you cannot live on the status quo. It is always a question of where is the world going? Uh, and we're going to a world where the certainty of traditional commodity demand growth is not what it once was. I may have a personal opinion that oil demand is likely to be flat or up, but I could also be wrong on that. And so can companies be nimble? There's no question that companies can have to compete on low cost of supply. There are a number of exciting new technologies that so far, I don't think we've had the true breakthrough besides Tesla, which has taken a dramatic share of the luxury electric vehicle market. And Greg, I have to say that I am personally a very happy owner of an electric vehicle for the past seven years. And I personally, out of personal choice, will never or am very unlikely to ever drive a gasoline car again, because I simply enjoy driving the electric vehicle better. And I think that's the type of kind of positive engagement and positive consumer choices I'd like to see. So if you're a company and if you're an analyst looking at companies, I'm always going to be monitoring where's an area of better opportunity and growth. And I think, I, I think it is about trying to figure out where the world is going to go. Now, a lot of people want traditional companies to transition more quickly into newer areas. And I think that's where I might be a little more skeptical. There isn't a lot of evidence of old, old line companies being the leader in the next technology. So it's not that they should do nothing. They clearly should be looking at it. But I think we have to be careful about wanting traditional energy to maybe be the leaders in new areas. We should want new companies, like a Tesla in the case of the auto sector, to be the leaders in the new sector. And then we'll see perhaps that's the catalyst for others to follow. So what I hear you saying is that don't count on oil and gas companies becoming energy companies and moving into, uh, say, Shell's not going to become a leader in uh, EV charging distributions like they are gas stations. Or you, So you don't really think that these large energy oil and gas companies are really good at transitioning to cleaner energy. Well, I, I might say it slightly differently. I, I think we don't know what they're going to be good at or not. We do know that last decade, in the business they're involved in, the return on capital was 0%. I don't think you have to be a Wall Street analyst to know that 0% profitability is a really low number. And so the first order of business is do better in the business you know best. I think you do have to keep an eye on the future. And so I look at a company like Occidental Petroleum, which has some expertise in enhanced oil recovery. They've got a carbon capture and direct their capture strategy. I don't know if it's going to be successful, but to me, it's a logical extension of what they're doing. There are other big companies that have these venture capital uh, type operations that are funding new technology companies. That to me makes sense. Uh, some of the large companies may not be experts, but being a venture capital backer of new technologies, that is something I generally get excited about. Uh, I, I will say when you think of things like EV charging, as someone who has firsthand experienced EV charging for the last seven years, I am never tempted to want to go to a gas station. I don't know why anyone would want to replicate the gas station model. And so I think when we think about future technologies, let's not make the mistake of thinking we have to replicate the old way of doing things. And this is often cited as a reason for why EVs won't take greater market share. I disagree. I think, uh, I, I think they can take a, a reasonable amount of share over a long, long period of time. We don't need to wait for all, every gas station to have an EV pump, quote unquote. Where I worry about EVs is, I think for those who are of more modest means and especially low income folks and a huge chunk of the developing world, I am skeptical that they're going to be able to switch to EVs. So let's include hybrids. Let's have much stricter regulation on heavier vehicles. How do we allow sport utility vehicles to basically get no extra uh, consideration for their extra weight and the environmental damage they do. Why are we subsidizing EV SUVs? I mean, there's probably nothing more insane than that. And so I think there's a whole bunch of things we can do to motivate a more positive future. How about we have free tuition for electricians and trade schools that are going to be needed to implement our electricity future? Why are we worried about college tuition? What about the trade schools? Those are generally people who are not from the most affluent communities. They might need some help for what they, I think there's so many things we can do, Greg. There's so many things we can do from a positive standpoint. I get excited about it, but then get frustrated when I see the kind of debate being either on the left, fossil fuels are evil and fossil fuels now, or on the right, solar and wind are dumb, the climate's always changing, let's do nothing. Neither of these extremes make sense. There is a positive middle ground and a pragmatic middle ground that can actually result in real progress. 
Right, and you're on the advisory board of an organization, Clear Path. That is that kind of center right position that approaches energy from a different perspective, but wants to solve the problem through exports and perhaps more nuclear and more carbon capture, a different set of set of tools and solutions. And we appreciate you coming on. And it is interesting to have you, board member of a major oil company who loves EVs, doesn't like gas stations. I wonder if you you share that in the boardroom, or they knew that about you before they let you come in. I, again, I don't think this stuff has to be ideological. I don't think being affiliated or covering or investing in oil and gas companies makes you good or evil. It's it's a critically needed energy source for the world. 83% of our energy comes from some combination of oil, gas, and coal. The world needs it. We have had the least number of people in poverty that we've ever had. We've had rapid population growth because of our industrial revolution fueled by fossil fuels. We now know that there's some limit to how much CO2 we want to put into the atmosphere. So there is absolutely a goal to decarbonize going forward. But let's not forget all the benefits and all the gains that we in the United States and Europe have clearly benefited from and that the rest of the world is going to want to benefit from uh, going forward. And so I'm very proud to be affiliated with the oil and gas industry, but I'm not ideological about it. So if the electric car is more enjoyable to drive, I like the one pedal on off. I like charging home. Who likes to go to a gas station? Then I'm going to drive an electric car and I'm, I'm excited to do so. I, I would look forward to like understanding heat pumps there's no such thing as 100% solution for any of our problems. We need a range of solutions, and they should be centered around ensuring energy is available and affordable, but that it's also environmentally friendly and lower carbon. It's all those metrics that we're trying to solve for. And as a driver of an EV for 10 years now, I'll share your enthusiasm for this. EV is just better, whether you care about virtue or not. I want to push back a little bit on um, your point that EVs are for elites or premium products. That has been the case. Tesla started up around $100,000. Now you can get a Tesla for less than the average cost of a new American car. Prices are coming down thanks to uh, scale, more products coming online. Line. And they and the Inflation Reduction Act did put in some income caps to get the to get that seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. So I guess I think EVs are have started as elite products, but now they're becoming. You know, you can get a Chevy Bolt for in the you know low what low thirties somewhere. They're becoming more accessible and affordable. So a couple different things here. I do live in a single family home. I, I live in a northeast state. My garage happens to be heated, which on the one hand is ridiculous. On the other hand, we're not going to remove the heat at this point in time. The one night I left it outside because we had some work being done, it lost half its battery overnight. And, and so there are some challenges, I think, again, if, you don't, if you're not lucky like I am to live in a suburban single family home with its own garage, that might be a challenge if people live in apartment buildings. And it's not that it's not solvable. I actually think it can be. I think the question is, I'm very concerned about these 100% EV mandates by some year. California's got one. Uh, I think New York State now has one. I don't like that as a metric. That, to me, is the kind of, I think, big government top-down initiative that I but, think is likely to fail. But, but, but and, hold on. G yeah. GM is, you know, California said we, we're going to ban sales of, of new gasoline engines, but GM already said we don't want to sell them. So the industry is ahead of government on, on this transition to electric mobility. It's not government saying you got, I mean, in some places it's government saying you got to do this, but GM and Mary Barra, CEO, are like, we don't want to build gasoline cars anymore. 100% agree with you. Let's keep it the way that industry says, I can see consumer preferences. Maybe they're going to be right on that opinion. Maybe they're going to be wrong, but let's have it stay that way. The problem with the mandate, again, is I do not believe it solves for the middle and least fortunate among us. So what I heard today is you are a Wall Street analyst who's on the board of a major oil company. You have in love EVs. You think they're better for people who can afford them. You don't like going to a gas station. You agree we need to decarbonize the economy. We might differ about how and how fast and that oil, big oil companies are not as big as they used to be. Did I, catch, did I get all that right? I think you did get it all right. And I, again, I'd say, First of all, thank you for having me. What are the positive solutions? Where do we agree? How do we stop making this a vitriolic fight to the death, right versus left, and then nothing gets done and we end up in this worst of all worlds of simply high and volatile commodity prices with no change to our greenhouse gas emissions? That doesn't help anyone. And by the way, it doesn't even help oil companies. For one year, they might get high oil prices, and then the next year they have recession. That does not do any company any good. What is good is to have sustainable economic growth, lifting people out of poverty. That is why we use fossil fuels in the first place. We now recognize we need to do a much better job on the environmental side. I will say that will always be better 
or usually be better if we're doing that in the US and Canada versus the rest of the world. And then lastly, let's do it with as small of a carbon footprint and let's motivate new technologies I think nuclear is beyond the scope of this podcast. That's going to have to be part of the conversation. We absolutely can have a sustainable future that does eliminate the worst risks of climate change while ensuring we do have healthy economic growth. Those are absolutely compatible goals. And let's stop fighting about this. Arjun Murthy is a partner at Veritin, an energy consultancy, and holds board or advisory positions at ClearPath, ConocoPhillips, and the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Arjun, it's been a pleasure to have this very vigorous debate with you and discussion. Thanks for coming on Climate One. Greg, thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate all you do with the Climate One podcast, and I will remain an avid listener. Thank you. The Conservative Climate Caucus includes around 80 Republicans in the House of Representatives with a stated goal of, quote, reducing emissions, not energy choices, end quote. They emphasize innovation and exporting American know-how. Utah Representative John Curtis chairs the Conservative Climate Caucus in the House. Before going to Washington, he served eight years as mayor of Provo City. I asked him how that experience informs his work in Congress. Well, um, I made the mistake of thinking Congress would be like uh, serving as mayor, <laughs> and it's uh, not anything like that. But the only thing that's similar is you have to go through an election to get there. But when you serve as mayor, um, you you work on issues that I would call are more quality of life issues. People care uh, if their trash cans picked up. They care about crime. They care about parks and recreation um, and, uh, and things that are very not always different, but frequently different than what we're dealing with here in Congress. They also tend to be more aligned. In, in Utah, the mayor is nonpartisan, so it's much easier to align people behind issues. But I did learn quite a bit there that's helpful here. For instance, um, I, I learned not to fear town hall meetings. I learned not to fear standing in front of a bunch of people who were mad at me and uh, found that dialogue uh, solved a lot of problems. And I think that's been very instrumental in my work here um, having, having served there. Hmm. Yeah. Mayors have to deliver like governors as well. Was, was there a particular moment when you realized I need to do something on climate? I don't know that it was a moment, but it was, um, the clean air in Utah has been an issue for many years. And, uh, for many people, I would say that's kind of the, 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 the point, uh, the entry point for these environmental issues. Uh, they didn't, and we still don't talk as much about climate as, as we do some of the other environmental issues, such as clean air. But as mayor, I was fortunate to develop a, a re reputation for being good on clean air. And I think that set my standards for coming here that I would also be good on other issues dealing with the environment. Yeah, I've certainly seen that flying into Salt Lake, the, the basin in the air as, as you fly in. It's, right. it's visible. And on that, you know, epic wildfires have been choking the American West. The Great Salt Lake is drying up amid a mega drought. And we've got big snow this year, though, as you know, as the, the chair of the ski and snowboard caucus, the ski industry is openly scared about declining snowpack in the end of winter as we know it due to heating caused by burning fossil fuels. So how have all these climate impacts affected you personally and your constituents? Well, first, I, I'm just going to take this little window to push back on something that you just said. I think you, you just uh, ascribed uh, the changes in the climate to fossil fuels. And the science that I've followed says it's, it's, it's the emissions uh, that's causing climate change. And I think that's a very important distinction. And uh, so just, just for the record, uh, I think uh, it's emissions. and uh, Which comes from burning. So it's, bur you know, it's not the fossil fuels themselves, but it's the burning that causes the emissions that causes the heating. Is that uh, Most often, mm -hmm. uh, but um, you, you, you referenced forest fires. We're certainly emitting a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from forest fires. Mm -hmm. uh, fossil fuels burn at very different levels of greenhouse gas emissions, depending upon the fossil fuel, uh, and the way that they're produced has a tremendous influence also, for instance, in methane leakage. And uh, for instance, I, I know that the um, natural gas that we uh, use here, produce here in the United States is substantially less methane than that of, of Russia. So that's why I make that distinction. I don't think it's as simple as saying fossil fuels. I think it's better to, to pinpoint emissions and then deal with emissions. 
Fair. So it's, it's, uh, they're, they're not inherently bad, but it's how we use them and how we extract them and what we do with them. Uh, you started the Conservative Climate Caucus in 2021. It now boasts a, around 80 members with a stated goal of, quote, reducing emissions, not reducing energy choices. How do you propose reducing emissions and not energy choices? What does that mean? Well, what a perf- I mean, that, that dovetails nicely with my previous little rant about uh, it's not fossil fuels. So um, I think it's been a mistake um, uh, to focus solely on fossil fuels is the problem here. The reality of it is, as I said before, emissions cause uh, the, the, the problem and not just U.S. emissions, worldwide emissions. And so those that are part of our caucus, first of all, we're not all completely like-minded. There's obviously many different opinions within the caucus. But as a general rule, I think it's fair to say that we care deeply about this earth. We keep care deeply about our stewardship. Uh, but we have some ideas that may differ about how we reduce emissions and, and what path will, will reduce emissions quickest and most efficiently. Right. And so, and so what are those things? Is that sort of, you know, so what's the palette of things that you would like to see, particularly as we have a new Congress right now? No one should be surprised that there's actually more we agree with uh, than disagree with many of my Democratic colleagues. And, and maybe just to throw out uh, some, some of those real common areas, uh, I think the caucus in general is, is, is really pleased with renewables. We, we like renewables. We feel like they're a very important part. We may disagree with some in the sense that we don't think they're the only answer. Um, they, they have a, a, an Achilles heel that's not, that I think will be resolved at some point, but it's not fully resolved, and that's storage uh, right now. But we, we like uh, renewables. Uh, we like nuclear. Um, and more and more, my Democratic colleagues are joining us on that and realizing you really can't get to a green future without nuclear being part of it. And, and quite frankly, without uh, additional innovation with uh, fusion or something else, nuclear currently has, you know, has to be a, a big part of it if we're going to if we're going to be green. I think we share that with our Democratic colleagues. I, I certainly know we share innovation and advancements that we would like to see happen with, I mentioned fusion and hydrogen, uh, that we share with our Democratic colleagues um, in common. I think probably the, the one area where we would disagree, and not completely, but in, to some degree, is the use of fossil fuels. We would point out that the U.S. has reduced more greenhouse gas emissions in the last decade or 15 years than anybody would have ever dared dream. And we've done that by using a natural gas and using natural gas to replace other fossil fuels, particularly coal. And that if we want to reduce worldwide greenhouse gas emissions, we have to have a conversation about using U.S. fossil fuels to do that. I, I like to point out that they can be part of the solution and, and not part of the problem. And um, replacing, for instance, Russian natural gas with U.S. natural gas would reduce dramatic amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. We're getting, uh, we're perfecting techniques like carbon sequestration and direct air capture, and I'll be the first to admit they've still got a ways to go, but I don't think they should be ruled out. And and I think that. You know, you, you heard President Biden with some interest say fossil fuels will be with us for the next 10 years. And that got a little bit of a laugh in the State of the Union because I don't know a single energy expert who doesn't say fossil fuels will be with us in, in the year 2050. And so I think the bigger question is not will they be with us, but will we have figured out to, how to use them cleanly? Right. I think even the Energy Information Agency says fossil fuels, even though the low carbon scenarios, there's still some use of fossil fuels and hard to decarbonize areas, aviation, et cetera. You mentioned carbon capture and it has that it has a ways to go. Taxpayers have put billions of dollars into carbon capture and storage. So far, the results have been underwhelming. In 2017, the coal giant Southern Company suspended work on the carbon capture portion of a $7 billion plant in Kemper, Mississippi. It's a private corporation pulling the plug on carbon capture that had support from President Trump and previous Republicans. Republican Governor Haley Barber of Mississippi. So how much mo taxpayer money and investor money should more should be put into carbon capture? Well, listen, if it were up to me, um, I would take all the incentives away from everybody. I would line everybody up on the starting line and say, look, the end goal is clean, reliable, affordable, safe. Go. And let's see who can get across that finish line with those with those parameters. I don't think you can find a single energy source that doesn't have, as I mentioned in Achilles, in Achilles Hill, for renewables, which is storage. 
nuclear, you could point to safety, right? I mean, all of our energy sources have some flaws. And uh, if it were up to me, we would let this free market um, uh, decide which of these will actually prevail. The fossil fuel industry is willing to invest on their own billions and billions of dollars into to direct air capture and carbon sequestration. Um, if we simply used the, the litmus test of, uh, is it taking a while to work? I'm not sure that we would have, that solar would have advanced mm -hmm. to where it mm -hmm. is today, right? And so I think we have to be careful ruling these things out too quickly. And I think you're wise to point out um, there has to be some limitations on and what we subsidize. And the free marketplace should have a pretty good hand in, in which of these prevail. Our current lawmaking um, is trying to pick winners and losers. Uh, there's some wisdom to that, but I do think we have to be careful. Um, for the IRA, for instance, uh, did a lot for carbon sequestration, direct air capture, nuclear, right? Really, for a lot of these things. Hydrogen too. Yeah, quite a, hydrogen. There was quite a bit of money in there. So, in, in a way, governments try to pick winners and losers. But like I say, if I if I had my way, would line them all up on a starting line and say go. And and here again, I'd refer to clean, reliable, affordable safe energy and, and what's going to be able to deliver that. You mentioned the IRA. That there's three big pieces of energy-related legislation that have happened under the Biden administration, infrastructure, chips, and the IRA. You're on the Energy and Commerce Committee. What's going to happen there in terms of those big bills? Is there going to be you know, repeal, kind of tweak? What's going to be the approach? You know, it's near impossible to predict, but I like to, to go back and look at history. And if you look at the Affordable Care Act, I think you'll see a very similar situation where it was kind of one party uh, that, that pushed it through. The other party, Republicans, were, were very opposed to it and uh, threatened to repeal it. At the end of the day, they were unable to. But that doesn't mean both Republicans and Democrats haven't made substantial improvements to the Affordable Care Act along the way. So uh, I would I would say, look, any piece of legislation is imperfect, particularly one that comes out really without um, much time and is thousands of pages. And I would expect that both Republicans and our Democratic colleagues would continue to try to refine and improve that piece of legislation. Right. And, uh, you know, some the Politico did a story that a lot of the benefits of the IRA is going to be in Republican districts or with members who, are, who are, <laughs> you, I guess you saw that article. <laughs> I didn't see that, but I've heard that uh, that reference, and you know, I don't know if that was uh, intentional, but to the extent it was, it was really pretty wise, because you know, people respond to what's happening in their districts. I've driven through Heber City in your district. There's lots of oil rigs and trucks, and there's also the new Grouse Creek South Wind Energy Zone. How do you balance the needs of your district today when it comes to the energy transition? So my original district, up until this last year, didn't have very much oil and gas. It had coal. And I, I've watched firsthand, really, the, the demonization and the destruction of communities that produce coal for decades and decades. And I think we forgot rather quickly how important these people were in our lives. And I see the same thing happening to oil and gas. It's what I would call a demonization of oil and gas. And I inherited with redistricting a, a, the Uinta Basin, which does a lot of oil and gas. And uh, during my first visit, they they looked at me and they said, sorry, you're the climate guy. This isn't going to work. <laughs> and um, as they listened more and more to me, they realized how important it was for Republicans, for conservatives, for people in oil and gas to be talking about the climate. And, and this is where I like to point out, look, we, we have a choice here. We can make them part of the solution or we can make them the problem. They are anxious to be part of the solution. They're anxious to clean up. They're anxious to be uh, an energy source for decades and decades into the future. And I talk those same principles with them, reliable, affordable, safe, clean. And um, they're, they're game. They're, they're ready to compete on that level. And when you talk to them like that and, and don't come to them saying like, we're going to wipe you out, they're Re remarkably responsive and they want to be in the game and they listen these are good men and women they want to leave this earth as uh, better than they found it just like everybody else they want to be good stewards and and they will strive for that given the opportunity coming up what role does messaging play in motivating climate action if you want to motivate somebody to engage in this you appeal to this just innate desire to leave this earth uh, for our grandchildren better than we found it and, and I wish sometimes the climate movement had spent more time appealing to that. That's up next. 
These days, politicians often say provocative things in order to grab headlines and raise money. But John Curtis, Utah representative and chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus, doesn't fit that mold. I asked him what some of his peers say in private that they wish they could say in public and why there aren't more Republicans like him. I think the reality is timing. I've found Republicans quite quick to engage. Uh, This caucus that I've started, the Conservative Climate Caucus, has 80 members. Most of those uh, came to me and asked me if they could be part of it. I think the time is right for Republicans uh, to speak out. I think Europe has been a great example of why we're needed in this conversation. Um, Look, we can make mistakes, and Europe's made some mistakes. And I think Republicans and conservatives, uh, they do want to lower emissions, but they want to make sure we don't duplicate some of those same mistakes. You came out with a six-step plan to address climate change. Can you explain what those six steps are and how you arrived at those points? They they deal with uh, six very, very important issues. Let me just mention a couple of them. And, and one of them is uh, the hot topic of the day, and that's permitting reform. Uh, my my colleagues on, on all sides know that we have some serious problems with permitting. The way I like to describe it is if you lined up all of your climate goals, all of your energy goals, permitting reform is in the way of every single one of them. It doesn't matter if it's a solar farm or a wind farm or a pipeline. Permitting reform is keeping all of these things from coming to fruition. So there's some really good bipartisan, I actually uh, left a hearing uh, to to do this podcast where we were talking about a a Republican proposal. And many people, uh, many colleagues understand this has to be bipartisan and, and want to find a bipartisan path forward on permitting reform. Uh, the other pillars uh, deal with using our, our resources here. We've got things, you know, this critical mineral is minerals is a very interesting discussion. Th- there's no scenario in which we don't need vast amounts of these critical minerals. And currently we're dependent on, on countries where we don't control the regulatory standards, the emission standards, the human rights standards. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people who feel like it's very hypocritical to, to be buying these overseas and prohibiting them here in the United States. And I, I tend to agree with that. And those are just a couple of, of, of principles from that that I think our, our Democratic colleagues would join us on. And it's important that we, we find that consensus. You stated, quote, that the impact of preventing climate change is worse than the impact of climate change. It doesn't need to be that way. Can you explain what you meant by that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Listen, uh, the climate movement, if not careful, uh, defaults to uh, calamity, crisis, um, woes, right? I mean, uh, you you hear all sorts of things that just aren't science. And the reality of it is we have some serious changes coming, and I don't don't mean to make light of those. But if you look at particularly at some low-income communities where where they can't afford their heating bills and, and they can't afford gas, um, that, that prefer climate change. I actually spoke to an activist who represents them, and, and she and I agreed that sometimes this, the medicine is worse than the disease, and we have to be careful with that and, and realize um, that we, we need to be talking more about adaptation. Look, if we, if we stopped all the greenhouse gas emissions today, worldwide, we're still on a trajectory of warming. And what are we doing about that, right? Very little. And um, I, I think that, that it's important to, to deal with that and also to realize, look, what happened in Europe was not good. And, and that is uh, no affordability, no reliability, dependent on an enemy for fuel, and now producing more greenhouse gas emissions than ever. And that's what I say, mean when I say, look, we, we want to be in this debate to make sure we don't duplicate th- those, those same mistakes. Well, certainly Germany did a deal with the devil that, that, that hurt them, though, in terms of, in terms of uh, alarmism, I would say that's true. I think climate people sometimes want people to move, and the only way they think they can make, get them to move is to make <laughs> them scared. Uh, and and so I, I have some strong thoughts about that. Um, <laughs> do, do share them. Listen. Well, well for first of all, if everything's a crisis, then nothing's a crisis. I don't believe that scare tactic motivates people. I just don't. I'm not involved in this because somebody scared me. I'm involved in this because somebody appealed to what I think we were all born with, which is an innate desire to be good stewards over this earth. And, and I think if you want to motivate somebody to engage in this, you appeal to that, what I believe we were all born with, which is this just innate desire to leave this earth uh, for our grandchildren better than we found it. And, and I wish sometimes the climate movement spent more time appealing to that. And, and quite frankly, that's what I do. That's 
why I found 80 Republicans as part of my caucus is is not trying to scare them or or threaten them, but rather to say, look, we've got a responsibility here, and um, and we do care deeply. Let's show people that we do. Yeah, opportunity often you know plays better than than fear. If I could just circle back to one thing you said though about reliability and affordability, um, there are some studies that say that the the cheapest power on Earth today is solar, utility scale solar. It beats even you know operating certainly new coal plants, even operating coal plants. There's challenges getting it to uh, to the load centers. That gets to permitting reform and distribution. Um, and with with batteries, you know, solar it, when you're getting pretty reliable. I have batteries at my house when the PG&E either burns something up or blows something up, you know, I still get electricity. So, you know, I think the reliability and affordability, isn't that changing on renewables? So it is. Um, Just as uh, the cleanliness is changing on fossil fuels, everybody has a lot of work to do. And the reality of it is you're very fortunate that you can afford batteries. Most can't afford uh, batteries because the technology is still too expensive. Yeah, on, on large scale, we're, we're storing, you know, I hear people putting in these battery storage things, which I, it's just great, but we're storing power for only about four hours, right? And so we have work to do. And I think the more successful we are, the more solar and wind will be, re, these renewables will be part of that mix in 2050. And the less successful we are, uh, the, the less of a role they'll play. And I think this is where I said early on, Republicans are all in on this and we're all in on uh, working on innovation for storage. I, there's a couple of interesting things. Uh, I was in Europe and I saw really they've almost moved past lithium batteries and to hydrogen for storage. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we talk about that enough here in the United States is that, you know, it, it may be that hydrogen is the, is the, the real storage uh, opportunity. I was in Taiwan uh, a couple of months ago and saw a hydro project where the water is released in the day and pumped back up at night uh, for storage. Um, and I, I think... I think our paradigms very likely will will change over the next decade or two based upon new innovations about how we store things. And the more successful we are, the, the more a role these renewables will play. Well, I'm certainly feeling comforted talking to you, Congressman, here substantively about real issues and having a back and forth. And, and it's making me encouraged about uh, uh, the hope for some bipartisan uh, progress. So I look forward to seeing what happens and hope that you, this caucus can do something in Congress. And because we've been hearing for a long time, I remember since the, since Pope Francis came to Washington, D.C. in 2015, there was going to be a Republican breakout. Republicans are going to come out strong on climate. Never quite happened. Um, but it sounds like maybe you're putting some together now. You know, um, I, I, this is where I'd like to point out, um, I, I'll give you that we have been terrible at branding uh, here, uh, but we have always cared. Uh, I think the, what I would say, the extremism sometimes in this conversation scares Republicans away. And um, I, extremism is not good on either side. We have it on our side as well in kind of the denial category. Um, but there's, there's extremists on both sides. But the reality, uh, as you know, if we want to make long-lasting changes, we need to be in a bipartisan mode uh, on this. And clearly, to the extent that we're bipartisan, we'll, we'll make quicker uh, action. I also like to point out that uh, we have had some successes um, I'd point to the Energy Act of 2020, which was a bipartisan uh, work that was really substantial, reduced hydrofluorocarbons by 85% in the United States. That was bipartisan. And, and I think another problem with this movement, we've got kind of the, on the one hand, right, the, the, the fear mongering. And on the other hand, we have this, whatever you do, it's never enough. And people sometimes get discouraged by saying, I can never please you. I can't do enough. And I do think it's important to point out, I know in my personal journey, I'm very grateful that I ran into people who who rewarded me for good behavior early on instead of criticizing me for uh, what I wasn't doing. And that motivated me to want to do more. And I think too often we, we do just the opposite. We kind of push people away from this. Well, Congressman, thank you very much. So John Curtis is House of Representatives from Utah's 3rd Congressional District and chair and founder of the Conservative Climate Caucus. Please do come back and we'll continue this conversation. Perfect. Uh, look forward to it. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate challenge. Talking about climate can be hard and interesting and frustrating and exciting, as you heard today. And it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. You can do it right now on your device. 
You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help them have their own deeper climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Wincy Sheeta is our development manager. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.